a fact is any observation that has been repeatedly confirmed. Um, normally, a fact will contain the keyword is, and a good example of a fact is that copper is a better conductor than rubber. So you see that word is in there, and that's normally something that everybody will agree on, and it's been repeated over and over and over and over again. A hypothesis is a testable statement about the natural world that can be used to build more complex inferences or explanations. The key part of that is testable statement. It's often a misconception to use the words educated guess, because it's really not a guess. Right? You usually have some background knowledge that helps you to develop that hypothesis. And it has to be a testable statement. Right? Some guesses aren't necessarily testable. So it's got to be testable. And it has to be testable within that realm of the natural world. So I can't say, oh, I think a ghost did it. That would not be a hypothesis because it's not testable, nor is it natural. A single hypothesis, or more likely a set of hypotheses, so a group of hypotheses, could develop into a theory or it could develop into a law. So when we say that these testable statements can be used to build more complex inferences, these inferences are either theories or laws. Some key words that you will see in a hypothesis, you might see the words related to, you might see the words may be, um, you might see the words if and then. So an example of a hypothesis is the conductivity of this wire is related to its temperature. And again, notice those words is related to its temperature. Another way of writing a hypothesis is using a pattern which uses if-then statements. So you would start off your hypothesis with the word if. The words that follow that are your proposed explanation. That explanation normally contains the independent variable sometimes called the modified variable. It's whatever you choose to modify in the experiment, whatever you're modifying on purpose. For example, you might say if the wire is warmer or if the temperature of the wire increases. So you're implying that the temperature is the independent variable. After that if statement, you make a then statement. And the then statement is your predicted result. And so that predictive result normally contains the dependent variable, sometimes also called the responding variable. So in other words, when you change the temperature of the wire, what happens? So example, then it will be a better conductor. So if the wire is warmer, then it will be a better conductor is an if-then hypothesis. And that's a great way of identifying your independent variable and your dependent variable because you'll always have your if statement followed by your independent variable. Notice the two I's, if and independent, and then you have your then statement followed by your dependent variable. Here are a few more examples of writing a hypothesis. A good hypothesis would be a very general statement that doesn't really give any specific prediction in any one direction. So the rate sugar dissolves is related to the temperature of the water. And you're predicting that there is a relationship. A better hypothesis would be that if-then statement where you're clarifying what your independent and dependent variable are. So if I increase the temperature of the water, then sugar will dissolve faster. So your independent variable follows that if statement, which would be your temperature. So if I change the temperature, then the sugar will dissolve faster. And so the speed or the rate that the sugar dissolves is your dependent variable. And a really good hypothesis would kind of combine the two together. If the rate that sugar dissolves is related to the temperature, then increasing the temperature will cause it to dissolve faster. So I've kind of taken that general statement and the if-then statement and made a really good hypothesis. Again, a testable statement that I could either support with evidence or I could disprove with evidence. Keep in mind that should I collect evidence that disproves my hypothesis, that incorrect hypothesis can still be useful because now I have a better understanding of how the sugar dissolves in the water. I know more than I did before. I now know what doesn't contribute to sugar dissolving. A theory is a well-substantiated explanation of some observation of the natural world. It could incorporate facts, it could incorporate laws, inferences, and tested hypotheses. 
A theory is supported by an abundance of observational and experimental evidence. So the scientific use of the word theory is very different than the common use of the word theory. In your everyday daily life, you probably use the word theory um, instead of the word guess. Like what's your theory or what's your guess? In science, a theory is a very well-tested, well-supported explanation. There's lots of evidence backing up that explanation. A theory will normally contain the words um, explains or indicates why something happens. So relating to the conductivity that we were talking about on previous slides, an example of a theory would be that of quantum theory. Quantum theory of conductivity states that electrical conductivity of a material is related to the kinetic energy of the valence electrons. So that theory statement is not just stating that there is a relationship between kinetic energy and conductivity, because that would be a hypothesis. But this is saying the reason why something conducts electricity better when it's warmer is because the valence electrons are moving around faster. A law is different than a hypothesis and is also different than a theory. A law is a descriptive generalization about how some observable phenomena of the natural world behaves under stated circumstances. Laws will have keywords like describes, you might see the word rate, or how, or maybe it'll be a mathematical formula. So an example of a law would be like Ohm's law. Right? Ohm's law states that the current flowing through an object is equal to the voltage across it divided by the object's resistance. So I could create a mathematical formula for that, and all I'm doing is stating the relationship between the current, the voltage, and the resistance. So comparing theories versus law. All right, a theory does not become laws. Common misconception. I saw lots of errors on your pretests showing that theories turned into laws or somehow they were upgraded to laws, and that is not the case. Those are two completely separate entities. Right? A theory explains why the observation occurs or why the phenomena occurs, but the law just describes how it's happening or what is happening. It doesn't really tell you why. It just states what the relationship is. Here are some examples okay, of laws versus theories. So let's look at Mendel's law. Mendel's laws are like the principle of dominance, the principle of recessiveness, the principle of segregation, all of those things you learned in biology. Those principles are explained by the chromosome theory. So the principle of segregation that says, you know, you've got two genes that separate from each other and you get one gene from your mom and one gene from your dad is explained because during meiosis, right, all of the chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell and then the chromosomes separate from each other and those chromosomes carry those genes. And so that's what causes those genes to segregate. So the explanation for why you only get one gene, why you don't get two genes, why those genes separate from each other is explained using the chromosome theory. And notice the dates. Okay, Mendel's laws or principles were in 1866. The chromosome theory was in 1915. Second one, Boyle's law. Boyle's law states that there is a inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Okay, notice that word relationship, and I'm just stating how they behave. So if I increase the pressure on, say, a balloon, its volume will get smaller. If I decrease the pressure on a balloon, its volume will get bigger. So as pressure goes up, volume goes down. That's that inverse relationship. They're changing in opposite directions. The kinetic molecular theory describes why that happens. So we'll learn about kinetic molecular theory more this year. And basically, gases have lots and lots of space between their particles. And when I put pressure on the balloon, the space between the particles gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The gas molecules get closer and closer together. So the bigger the pressure, the smaller the space between the molecules. That's the kinetic molecular theory behind Boyle's law. Again, notice the dates. Boyle's law was in 1670, and the kinetic molecular theory was kind of developed throughout the 1850s. And then we've got Newton's laws. First law of motion is that, you know, an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by some outside force. Or there's Newton's third law, right? The, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Notice the theory explaining Newton's laws. We don't have one. We don't know why an object at rest tends to stay at rest. We don't know why there's this 
We have no way of explaining that yet in science. But what I want you to understand, okay, remember the misconception. A lot of you thought that a hypothesis became a theory which became a law. All right, theories do not come before laws. According to those examples that I gave you, the laws come first, and then later on we figure out why they are that way. We're able to explain how that phenomena happens. All right, last two things are the way that scientists do science, the process of doing science. First thing that often happens is that you start with an observation that evokes a question. So you see something or you notice something and you begin to wonder why that happened. And then using your brain and using logic and reasoning and any previous knowledge or experiences you might have had in your life, you state a possible answer for that. And that possible answer is called a hypothesis. Remember that the hypothesis is not a guess, right? Because you're using logic and you're using previous knowledge and that it is a testable statement. It's something that you could design an experiment to test. So that you design that controlled experiment. And that word controlled means that you're keeping all variables the same except one. And the one variable that you manipulate is your independent variable. All the other variables that stay the same, those are your controlled variables. As you're doing your experiment, you would then record and analyze those results. And then after analyzing the results and looking for patterns, you would draw conclusions. And those conclusions we call inferences. So remember, inferences are the logical explanation that we have based on evidence and based on the data that we collect. And then finally, you have to publish those results. You have to put those results out there in some sort of journal or magazine or newspaper or blog so that other people, other scientists can read it and try to verify it, try to duplicate it, to make sure that your experiment is sound and that your conclusions are reasonable. Now one misconception is that all scientific knowledge has to be acquired in this way. You have to follow this order and that is not the case. You can jump around. Um, you could have a hypothesis and then perform a controlled experiment and do your results and then maybe maybe you find another question and so you perform a different experiment and so you can keep jumping around between these. It's also possible to do an experiment in the reverse direction and these are called observational studies. These are very common in biology and these are very common in ecology. So in an observational study you start with the observation and again, that evokes a question. So you're like, I wonder why that happens. And so instead of developing your hypothesis first, you actually collect and record observations. And you get all this data. And then you analyze that data. And you look for patterns in that data. And you try to state a possible explanation for why that data occurs. And again, that possible answer, that is your hypothesis. That is your testable statement. Somebody could then take that hypothesis and design an experiment and test it. And then finally, just like in the experimental study, you publish your results in a peer-reviewed journal, and that allows other people to look at your data and see if they can find alternative hypotheses. Because sometimes two different people can look at the exact same data and come up with different answers. So in class, just a couple days ago, we did the checks activity, right? The checks activity was an example of an observational study. You started off with a question, I wonder what happened, and you collected some evidence, right? You collected a couple different checks, and then you developed a hypothesis, and then you were able to get some more data, and so you revised your hypothesis, and then you were able to get some more data, and you revised your hypothesis. And then we got together with um, some peers, right, and we reviewed our work, and we were able to see if we could come up with any other possible explanation that would best explain that evidence. So the checks lab that we did in class the other day is an example of an observational study.